Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Samudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Samudasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Samudasa Homage to him, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay. So we are going to start, and I'm hoping some of you have your books. You know, if you have the Majima Nikaya, um, but you can take notes and chase it up later. You can chase it to find it. Uh, but if you have your um, Majima Nikayas, with me when I'm teaching, you're gonna really learn the Majima Nikai. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. Okay, how this book really is an amazing visit, an amazing thing. So the first thing we're gonna do is go to page 934. And um, we, uh, um, that's right, let me see, did I do that? All right. Oh, okay, first of all, you have two things that are going on with right effort. You have right effort and you have right striving. Now, what we pretty much, I have pretty much figured out and, and Bonte agrees with me on this part is that right effort is when we teach you the steps of right effort. And actually the six R's are the steps of right effort, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and the right striving means it's exactly the same thing, but it means that the brain has taken this and turned it into a um, habitual intention, the habitual, habitual tendency for you so that you don't have to think about it anymore. Now, I, for, I think maybe six years ago, I had a student in New York and he was working very hard with TWIM and he realized after about two months is when it happened the first time I detected it in one of my students. And um, he, he contacted me because of an incident that happened where everything happened automatically. And so how did this happen? It's really simple. You are retraining your mind to have a new habitual reaction for things that are pulling you over to unwholesome mind states. And the symptoms for craving is a rising of tension and tightness and the pressure of a personal opinion jumping out. That's a description of your right, uh, of your craving when it's coming up. It always manifests as tension and tightness in the mind and body you can detect it. This is why I like the, um, the Vipassana practitioners because they've actually been practicing to detect sensations in the body. And if they just open their minds to this idea, when we explain to them that craving is indicated that it's arising, it's coming when there's a tightening that starts to happen. And they can detect it very quickly if they learn to do their six R's at that time, then all of a sudden things are going to open up. And what happened for this man was he was taking walks and people were harassing him in the part of New York City where he lived. And then one day he, he used to get very mad and his blood pressure would go up and he'd get very upset if he was walking with his wife and these guys came along in a van and started harassing him. And then it happened after about two months of really working with this and running, reflecting in his mind and um, meticulously thinking all the time about being in the present time and about, about uh, metta and karuna, about, about loving kindness and about forgiveness and, uh, and this sort of thing. This is what happened to him. All of a sudden they did that and he sent them metta automatically. He sent them the wholesome. He'd let go of the unwholesome. He let it fall away, let it go. He recognized it, let it go and passed away, but the brain recognized it. And then it picked up and he just smiled and started sending the metta. Like you poor 
people who don't know how anything <laughs> works, he said. And I, you know, he, I was so happy when this happened, but it never occurred to me then what I was actually watching until about a few months ago, putting together the difference between right effort and right striving, which there is in the text, absolutely no difference at all in the translation. It's the exact same paragraph describing the steps, a right effort and describing the steps of, of right uh, striving. So we're gonna look at some of this today and we're gonna look at how this affects right view also, how this is intertwined with the establishment of right view. And why is right view so important is because this is our perspective of how we're looking at what's happening around us all the time. Are we taking it personally with Atta, with personal opinions and grabbing onto it? Or is something else happening where we're just learning to see this as something that is an occurrence and this occurrence is just rising up, it's there, and we know it's going to pass away because of Anicca, okay? So let's start here. I wanna say that uh, it is confirmed, right, the right effort, exactly what it is first. If you go to page, um, page 1100 in your text, oh, let's see page numbers, here you go. <laughs> uh, page numbers here, and you go to um, 1100, and on that page, come on, we go here. Mm -hmm. You're going to see you're in the Satchivibhanga Sutta, number 141, and you're at section 29. So when I read this to you, you're actually you're listening to me read. I say right effort here, but I'm actually saying right striving or right effort. That's what's real, okay? Now it says, what friends is right effort? So they're labeling it as right effort in the Eightfold Path in the Sutta. And then he says here, a monk awakens his zeal. We say enthusiasm. We wanna talk about zeal too much. Missionaries are running around with zeal. <laughs> okay, we're not missionaries, but we're saying enthusiasm is what's coming up. Enthusiasm for the non arising of unarisen, evil, unwholesome states. And we're going to talk about two ways that this works as we go along, because one of them is easy and the other one is very hard. And the other side of this, when we talk about these words in here, you could take them to mean the very hard side of things. If you had no knowledge about how everything works, you would easily fall into the trap of, uh, and the knowledge I'm talking about is the knowledge of the unwholesome states are usually disturbances, distractions. And if you have no knowledge of how they work, what they are, how they operate, and how, how they uh they have something they need and how you can let go of it. If you have not, never heard that, you would believe very easily these words I'm reading you sound like a lot of work. Listen to them. Um, zeal for the non-arising of the unarisen evil unwholesome states. He makes an effort. He arouses energy, exerts his mind, and he strives. He awakens the, the, the enthusiasm for the abandoning of the arisen evil unwholesome states, and he makes an effort, arouses energy, and exerts his mind and strives. He awakens enthusiasm for the arising of unarisen wholesome states. He makes an effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. And he awakens enthusiasm for the continuance. This is great. C -c the continuance, the non-disappearance, the strengthening, the increase, and the fulfillment of development of arisen wholesome states. And he makes an effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind, and strives. This is called right effort. Now, this is in section 29, 141. Let's just take this for an example. When we do, when we re research like this, we go, we have to take and we have to break down these words. Okay. So if we were looking at um, at what we're talking about in um, 
how we're doing this awakens enthusiasm for the non arising of evil unwholesome states. Okay, we know you're not supposed to be doing anything to stop the brain from having these states arise. You're not supposed to stop it, your brain from operating. There's nothing in the text anywhere we can find. There's no master theologians who have the books memorized completely in their mind who can tell me that that's in there. It's not there. We're not supposed to stop our brain's operation. We are supposed to be explorers, observers, discoverers of how all of this works. So we don't go upsetting stuff by trying to stop the operation. We want to see how does it actually work. So we awaken the enthusiasm for the non-arising of evil unwholesome states that makes an effort. It, uh, he, now, here's a difference. The, you can make an effort with an educated effort. How does the hindrance operate? And you have some information about that. We've talked a lot here about that and how it works, and we've gone to the text. We have uh, nine or 11 suttas that kind of tell us exactly how it operates and what makes it come, what makes it strong, what makes it weak, and how can it fade away, okay? But, or you, or you could come and you could just get exhausted by striving to make uh, this stop when it comes up, you, you don't want to do that. <laughs> That's exhausting. And it's personally an effort that you don't want to be using atta if you're trying to develop anatta. You don't want atta to get involved. Okay. So that one, it seems like if you have the knowledge, you don't need to make a lot of effort. It's a different kind of effort. It's an effort to remember how everything works. That's the way I see that. Now, arising and arousing energy, that's a good one. Arousing energy is important, but let's take an example of this. You know, I was a singer and I had to do a lot of work for operatic training and classical music. So I learned how to breathe. And I was lucky because I was sick when I was little because that's when I learned my body had to survive by breathing from the diaphragm. So if you're breathing from the diaphragmatically breathing, then there is no effort in breathing a lot of air in to hold up a note for a long, long, long period of time. But if you're breathing without the diaphragm, just here and the lungs up here, without the diaphragmatic breathing, you only have one level of filling the lungs with air, only one. And it's very hard work. So you don't want to do that. You want to remember to um, when you're arousing energy, that you are arousing energy for yourself to keep meditating and remember all the knowledge that you have. So you're using it all the time. Our knowledge for this stuff is great because it's all applicable. It's all, you're using it all the time. So it's not too hard to move into this position of learning how to weave this together but it could be tough if you learned things in very isolated ways, each topic. So we're trying to show you how this works. Next one is he exerts his mind. He can do that gently exerting his mind by bringing it to what he needs to do quickly and making that happen. Or it can struggle very hard because he's not sure what to do and he's really struggling. And once again, he gets exhausted. We hear a lot about people struggling with hindrances who are just really, really, really exhausted. And I can't understand it, but when I looked into it and tried to interview people who were teaching, I found out that they didn't understand right effort in this way that we're talking to you about. So there was only one way effort could be applied. And that is the first few definitions in the dictionary about effort of working hard, struggling, persevering, pushing, making sure you don't stop. But that's not supposed to be here because why? <laughs> because we told you in the beginning, this was easy to understand and immediately effective, inviting deeper inspection, and it wasn't going to be touched by time. That was our prerequisites to find this practice that was going to fit into that that hole okay and that's important 
to try to do that. So, and then he strives. Well, does he strive with knowledge once again, or does he strive without knowledge? To strive can mean to continue on and to keep always doing this every time you need to do it, to strive to remember that. And to, to use your right effort is helping you to remember to strive and always do all six of the steps or all five of the steps and repeat them every time you need them, okay? Um, so once again, it's a case of with knowledge or not with knowledge. That gets pretty interesting. Okay, so, so you realize an unwholesome when you're practicing in your practice, you realize the unwholesome, you release the unwholesome, you bring up the wholesome, and you keep the wholesome going. That's the framework of what we just talked about. That's all that is. So if you, you know, deductive reasoning down a little bit logically, this is where you come to the steps. So when we look at our practice, we have a couple little, two little things added in. Where'd that come from? Well, that came from Bonte living in a cave and really wanting to find out the answer and everything he knew about Anapanasati, he knew a lot about that. And he knew the instructions by heart for many years. And he looked at that and he said to himself, this is the one place we have a real description of instructions for meditation. All the other meditations that come down, that description of instructions in Nanapanasati, that's really accurate for all meditations to pay attention to the pieces that are in that. And two of the pieces that are in that are relaxing the mind, tranquilizing the mental formation and tranquilizing the bodily formation. What if that need, that has to be in there? Doesn't matter if we're using breath for the object of meditation or if we're using the uh, metta and brahma viharas for your object of meditation. This, uh, these components have to be there. The other thing is bring up a wholesome and keep the wholesome going. Well, these right effort, right striving is supposed to be happening really, really fluently. Bonte will say within two to three seconds, I agree with him. That's it, about two or three seconds. It should be happening. By the way, if I'm talking fast, <laughs> remember to put me on 0.75 when you listen to this again. If you think it's too fast, it comes out pretty good. I have to say that. But I grew up in Philadelphia and we talk fast in Philadelphia. New, New Yorkers are the same way. Okay, so now, you bring up a wholesome, how can the human being bring up a wholesome mind state really quickly? How? Smile. <laughs> Smile. Laugh at if you feel like you were caught. Don't be afraid to laugh at yourself. Ah, I, it got me. You know, the water came in the front window when the monsoon hit. Yeah, split second. Okay, laugh at it. Laugh at it. It's all over the floor. You almost fell down. You didn't see it. So what? Clean it up and remember to put towels there next time the monsoon comes. Yeah, okay. Smile is the best thing to clear the mind. It, it kicks out anger, irritation, frustration, anxiety. Clicks. It just clicks it right out. Then the last step says, keep the wholesome going keep smiling. If you keep these muscles going, you're going to stay young. I bet you don't know how old I am. <laughs> okay, you're going to stay young. All right. So you keep the wholesome going as much as you can with your mind because it will stay clear. It helps your mindfulness. It helps the more knowledge you have about how all this works. Okay, so that's what we do there. Now, I want you to go back over to um, page uh, 934. We just looked at right effort being confirmed on 1100. Okay, so we saw that in the Eightfold Path. I take that one out. I'm going to confuse myself with all these tags. Okay, so 934 is the Great 40. That is the Mahachitarasaka Sutta. 117, the great 40. Now, when we go in here, we have a few things to look at here. First of all, 
we have to look at view. So I'm going to read this section. You listen to this a little bit. It starts at section four. Right view comes first, monks. And how does right view come first? One understands wrong view as wrong view and right view as right view. This is one's right view. So you have to understand that, okay? And we go, I go some back here to, um, let's see, 1100 <clears throat> in the notes. I like to play with the notes sometimes, see how they're doing. Um, two kinds of right view are forerunners, the right view of insight and which investigates formations as impermanent suffering and, and uh, non-self. So it means the uh, Anicca Dukkha Anatta and right view of the path, which arises as a consequence of uh, seeing the insights and effects of the destruction of the defilements as they're happening. So gradually you're letting go. If you're practicing, uh, the Brahma Viharas, this is really cool because <laughs> the four pieces of the Brahma Viharas are canceling out four very important things that are actually the root causes of the five hindrances and six, 11 to 16, all the way up to like, I think it's 30 different Dis distractions that are mentioned to us that have to be solved, they're all coming from these four up here. So let's stop and look at that for just a minute, okay? Let me take you into the, into the board and anybody who hasn't seen this, I really want you to look at it because it's kind of it's kind of neat. Push the guy, oops, push this down here, oops. Oh, here, there we go. Okay, so if we're practicing with um, metta, and then it becomes karuna. We don't practice with karuna, like in some, some approaches they practice metta. Okay, now we're going to practice karuna. We don't do that. Now we take the metta and we allow it to get to the proper play, level to move up into the head and become karuna and the feeling of the metta changes to karuna. This one is compassion. Okay, then it moves on to mudita. And mudita is joy. All of a sudden, you might feel this happening if you're a teacher. They, they feel it. You know, all of a sudden, they start noticing, I am so excited over this student that has just more than they're excited about anything they're working on in their life. They experience this feeling you are so happy that someone else succeeded at something whether the person survived COVID and got better or whatever the good thing was, you feel it for them. It's a, it's a sympathetic or empathetic joy. It's an empathetic joy. And they say altruism, that's the old way of talking about it, but empathy means I feel that other person's joy. I know it's not mine, but I'm really happy, okay? Mudita and the last one is upeka. Upeka. Now, this one is loving kindness. We're just going to put an LK. This one is compassion. Okay. This one is joy. And this one is equanimity. Balanced mind. Now, when you're practicing metta, the mind abandons any thoughts of ill will. They're gone. They disappear. And when you're practicing karuna, any thoughts of cruelty, they are gone. They can't, okay? When you're practicing the joy, okay, that one, you cannot have any thoughts of discontent when the joy is up. And you can feed it being up. You can support it to stay up in your life and not, and, the more you do that with your mind, it hears you say, no more thoughts of discontent, no more thoughts should come up. And the last one happens later in your development, but this one is aversion to anything. So these actually are the seeds. This is what's fascinating to me. 
we did a great big chart one time with about 35 people that were really good meditators. We spent four days on it. One of the things we worked on was the deduction um, of how the hindrances are working. So if you look, if I just do it with this, we would say this one, lust and greed, then hatred and aversion, aversion, I'm doing this in a bad way, but I'm, I'll try and fix it. It should be lust and, and greed should be here. Um, okay, there we go. I'm being very nice now. Okay. Hatred, aversion, discontent. Uh, okay, one, well, the, we can, they're not actually lined up like this. I'm sort of, I don't want to mess you up. So let me keep going. Hatred and aversion. And then we have, um, Restlessness, guilt, remorse is the combination for that one. Mm -hmm. Oh, I went too far. We needed sloth and torpor. Sloth and torpor. And that one is sleepy, dull mind. And then we'll just stick doubt in down here, cousin doubt. We don't want to leave her out. Oh my goodness. Okay. So now what you do is you play a game. And so you see that meta cancels out ill will, lust and ill will, they lust and greed and ill will, they come together. So if lust comes from the source, you use these as the sources. You can do this yourself on a piece of paper like this. And then you put as many as you can figure out of these down here. And uh, don't pay attention to these up here so much. Pay attention to these four. You're going to root it back. Ill will. You have ill will towards someone. You have hatred. You go like this. Aversion. Um, aversion to discontent. So you start drawing lines to connect things. You're like building a quilt. And what we found when we went through about nine suttas, or I think we could have gone all through 11 of them, um, we pulled out everything that was mentioned as a um, distraction. And they were all rooted back to these four, these four here, except for two. I can't remember what two they were, but I remember two of them, it didn't exactly go back. They were sort of isolated. So I'm gonna stop this now and go back here, keep going with you. So this is how we see how everything is woven together. See, I've been doing this. This is my 21st year. That's scary. <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> but, you know, uh, but all those years of seeing this, and only this was in 2017 that we did this chart, and we started pulling these together like this to see they're all making this kind of cloth. They're coming together. They're all interrelated, the problems and then the solutions are even woven into that. So we listen to this, he goes through. What is wrong view? There is nothing, uh, there is nothing given. This is the person, you give nothing, nothing offered, nothing sacrificed, no fruit or result of good and bad actions. No, no this world, no other world, no mother, no father, no beings who are reborn spontaneously. These are the beliefs the person has. No good or virtuous recluses or Brahmins in the world who have realized for themselves by direct knowledge, seeing, actually seeing what's happening, how things are working, and declare this world and the other world. This is wrong view. They don't see, they don't practice to actually see how things are working they practice in another way with instructions and practice, instructions and practice, but they're not watching exactly to see. Okay, so it's a different kind of practice, but, and what, what is right view, it is twofold. There is right view that is affected by taints and partaking of merit, ripening in acquisitions, and there is right view that is noble and taintless and super mundane factor of the path. And so there's two different kinds. And then he says, and what is right view that is affected by the taints and partaking of merit and ripening 
in the acquisitions. There is what is given and what is offered and what is sacrificed. And there is fruit and result of good and bad actions, understanding how that works, the karma. And there is this world and the other world. There is mother, there is father, there is beings who are reborn spontaneously. And there are in the world good and virtuous recluses and Brahmins who have realized for themselves by direct knowledge and declare the world and the other world, they speak correctly about this. And this is right view affected by uh, some taints partaking of merit and ripening in acquisition. So you're progressing your understanding in the right direction. But then there is right view that is noble, taintless, super mundane factor, the path. Once you reach path and you're going down, now it changes a little bit. It's the difference between the super mundane wisdom and the power of wisdom and investigation. Okay? It's the difference between uh, super mundane wisdom and the power of wisdom and investigation in the process, but they're both good. Okay? And the wisdom the faculty of wisdom, the power of wisdom, the investigation of states, um, and the enlightenment factor, the path factor of right view is one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, who possesses the noble path and is developing the noble path. This is right view. That is noble, taintless, super mundane, and a factor of the actual path. If we go to 1103 and read this one, it's kind of interesting to note. The definition uh, defines the super mundane, the right view as wisdom, that's the Panya, found among the aids uh, to the enlightenment as a faculty. One of the faculties is wisdom, power, enlightenment factor, and the path factor. The definition is formulated by way of the cognitive function, your understanding, okay? Let's see, that's a ch Rather than the objective content of right view. Elsewhere, there is also right view of the path defined as knowledge of the Four Noble Truths. And we may understand that the conceptual comprehension of the Four Noble Truths falls under the mundane right view. Now listen carefully. While the direct penetration of the truths by realizing Nibbana with the path constitutes the super mundane right view. When you're on the path, pursuing the path with the objective, this is a super mundane right view to be doing that way. When you're investigating, and working at the first level of it before reaching path, okay, then you're working at the mundane levels. There's all different levels of working at this. This is cool. So you have a super mundane and you have um, the other understanding. Now, the bottom part of this is cool because it says one makes an effort to abandon wrong view and to enter upon right view. And this is one's right effort. So every time you're practicing with the six R's, every time you are applying the steps of your six R's, you are practicing right effort and you are practicing uh, right view. Mindfully, one abandons wrong view. Mindfully, one enters upon and abides in right view. That's what's happening each time you're doing, recognize the unwholesome mind state let go of the unwholesome mind state, relax the mind, then pick up the wholesome mind state with a smile and come back to what you are doing and continue on with that. You're, when you smile, that's the feeling of a wholesome mind state that you're getting. And so any state that's giving you that feeling inside, that's a wholesome mind state. And that's what it means the one's right effort to continue to make more wholesome mind states. And this is right mindfulness. So he's showing you that when you are practicing the six R's, you are practicing right mindfulness. So these three states run in a circle around right view. 
that is right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. And so these three are hooked together, the right view, the right effort, and the right mindfulness. This is how it's all coming together. Now, we look in another place in, um, oh, okay, let's go here. Um, in 17, the great 40, okay, so perspective leads to understanding, right effort, right mindfulness. We did that one. Um, and okay, only way that you can accomplish this is by using what we call productive concentration. If we say in our teaching, when we say unification of mind, what we mean is productive level of concentration. That means so that you can see not too hard, not pressure in the mind, not pinching here, working really hard. Why? Well, if you haven't been here before, we try to teach you to understand specifically what an object is for. That's important because your object, your object, what is it actually for? Now we hear uh, sometimes the term, it's our anchor. Yeah, but let's, if you've been sailing or you think about a boat, when you are in a boat, and you are in the harbor, the boat is here and it's in the harbor and you put down the anchor, you put down the anchor to hold the boat here in the water like that. It's gonna sit here in the water for the night and you're gonna to go to sleep in the boat. It's only there so that you can't float away. You cannot float away. It's holding you in spot like that. But the anchor itself, this anchor that goes down to the bottom it doesn't have anything for you. It doesn't have any knowledge, doesn't hold any secrets, isn't going to help you get to Nibbana to stay with the anchor. You have to be able to steer the ship to go the rest of the way down the river to the ocean to get the full amount of the knowledge and wisdom. You have to do that. You can't just stay there, okay? So what did the anchor really mean? The anchor meant if I did start to float away, I could come, would be held back right to that anchor. I could come back to it. It's my recentering point, my rebalancing point for correcting my level of concentration so that I can still watch inside. To watch what? Watch the arising, the origination of any phenomena that arises. Watch the, notice the, how it comes without me asking it to come. The thought will come up in my head, okay? And so the origination and the disappearance of it, you do nothing and you leave it there and Nietzsche assures you it will go away. So the origination of it, the disappearance of it, it's up to you whether there's gratification or not. Do you make it pleasant or painful or anything like that means you're getting involved with it. You're getting involved with this, what came up, with the thought that came up. You want to stay with your object of meditation always. The Now we do hear that, um, okay, the last one was the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger is that if you are getting involved in gratification, you are leaving behind your spiritual friend or your breathing and you're getting involved in a thought that came up you're not paying you're not using the breath as an anchor anymore you are or using the loving kindness as the anchor correctly you are going somewhere else you are getting involved with that something else and if you have any questions about it want to interview it find out why it came where it came from the past anything like that all of a sudden you're doing this meditation and here's the anchor over here here's the boat <laughs> and you left and you started to analyze something about that that arose whatever arose okay now What arose is, is not important except in one way. How did it happen? So you take a walk. How did that thought come up? Or even inside the meditation, how did it come up? I didn't stop working with my spiritual friend, but it came up. How'd that happen? Because you have a brain. 
because you have a brain and it's working really fast and you're not going to stop that brain from happening from working it you can't turn it off just to meditate that's not how all this works now what happens is you keep watching it and the observation power the mindfulness of observing the observation instrument gets going to a certain level where things feel like they slow down but your brain does not slow down it still fires to operate the body really 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 fast but in the mind it's slowing down producing because why because these things that come up these distractions they need food to survive and if they have food they'll stick around they'll come back again they'll stay and they'll get stronger and they'll stay longer so what do we do about that remember over here i said about right effort it's all based on knowledge and the knowledge is about that hindrance that's what the knowledge is that you need to have the nutriment of the hindrance is my personal attention my personal attention on that hindrance feeds it to get bigger stronger and stay there longer this is a fact we can go into the Samyutta Nikaya, we can look and see how it talks about the importance of the nutriment, the, the nourishment and the denourishment of a hindrance in direct relationship to the arising or the non-arising of guess who? The seven enlightenment factors. And you say to me, well, what's so important about the seven enlightenment factors? Well, the seven enlightenment factors, they have to stop doing this, you know, doing, uh, doing this here, like all different levels while you're operating your meditation and go like that and get exactly in alignment evenly. And then you can fall into cessation. There's no other way you can eventually fall into the deeper levels. It can, it can stop you from falling in from infinite space into infinite consciousness or infinite consciousness into nothingness or nothingness into neither perception or non-perception. It can stop you if you're not paying attention to how the hindrances actually work. Everything stands on the hindrances for the smoothness and the steadiness of going down the path. If you understand them, then you can stop them just like that. How do you stop them? Hmm. Most people who are here with me probably don't like war. And if you had two armies, one over here and one over here, and this one wants the other one's country and they're going to defend it and these guys are coming they're coming and tomorrow is going to be a big battle but this guy over here he knows something he knows where the supply route is for this army he knows how they're getting it from this road down here to keep this army strong so it can eventually attack them what is the strategy for evading the war confrontation, not destroying the land, not hurting the people or the property, and ending the war without the battle? Ah, Sun Tzu says, destroy the supply route. Take away the food and they have to go home take away the nourishment from your hindrances don't feed them anymore see what happens this is where we're supposed to be the explorer you know i was listening to dr punaji this week and he was talking about how important it is to question 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 and you must explore or, and when he teaches you, he wants you to explore, just like Bonte, he does. He wants us to explore. 
where our teaching is not in stone. One time somebody came to me and he said, you know, you people are really something funny. There's something funny about you because your teaching, it changes every so many years, it changes. And I looked at him and I said, of course it changes. It's not locked in stone. We're trying to explain to you the way the Buddha was teaching. If we find out this works best to explain it, and then we find something better that makes more people understand it easier. We're going to explain it easier next year and it's gonna sound a little different. But at the same time I say that, when you listen to Bhante Vimala Ramsey, one thing anybody can say about him, you listen to something that he's taught, take one of the suttas and listen to it in 2005, 2009, 2010 and 2021 or 2019 and then now, they're gonna sound the same. And how are they gonna sound this so consistent? How can he be so consistent? This one man asked me once, I said, because he's not doing this. He's taking us back to the text and taking us through step by step to show us these points. That's why, that's why he's doing it. Let's go to 117. We are in grade 40. So we need to go uh, over to uh, page, um, uh, let's see, wait a minute, I'm sorry. We're gonna go to number 77. We already did what was in 117. We'll go down to, 77 section 10 start there and it's page 635 i think you go back to 635 okay Six thirty-five. here we go here we go and when we come back here we have an interesting thing here this is, I love Udayan. He's one of my favorite characters. Udayan, we would not have the Padimokha. We would not have the Padimokha, which, uh, or, or the, the Vinaya. We not have the Vinaya. We would not have the Vinaya or the Vinaya, however you want to say this. I'm, I'm not sure what's correct there. But uh, you would not have the Vinaya if you didn't have the adventures of Udayan. <laughs> Okay, he's the one. So however, Udayan, there are five other qualities because which my disciples honor, respect, revere, and venerate me. This is the Buddha speaking to him. And, uh, and they live in dependence on me, honoring and respecting me. What are the five qualities for this reason that they, res they honor me, respect me, revere me, and venerate me, and live in dependence on me. And we're going to look at these real quickly. There's three here, higher virtue, Udayan, my disciples esteem me for the higher virtue. The recluse Gotama is virtuous. He po possesses the supreme aggregate of virtue. This is the first quality because of which my disciples honor, respect, revere, and venerate me. And they live in dependence on me, honoring and respecting me. Why? Because if you keep your precepts, they work as an umbrella to keep the hindrances from coming down on you. They work just as an umbrella would work, okay? You keep your precepts, it protects you from the hindrances coming. Let them go after the retreat and then have problems in life with hindrances. Don't come running to me because after retreat, a lot of people let them go because we have a, a kind of translation that goes around that these were training precepts. That is not a correct translation. I have gone through this with poly um, scholars and ask them about it. That's not correct. There's no place in the text that says these were just for training. These are for a smooth trip in life and a smooth trip in meditation. So that's the first quality. Second one, knowledge and vision. My disciples esteem me for my excellent knowledge and vision. When the recluse Gotama says, I know something, he truly does know because he says, I see, he truly sees. And the recluse Gotama teaches the Dhamma through direct knowledge, not without direct knowledge. He teaches the Dhamma with a sound basis, not without a sound basis. He teaches the Dhamma in a convincing manner, not in an unconvincing manner. There's another 
a sutta that's identical to this phrasing. It is found in Anguja Nikaya, a book of threes, number 125. And that one says basically, I do not teach a Dhamma without a basis. I do not teach a Dhamma without knowledge. I do not teach a Dhamma with, that is antidotal. I teach a Dhamma that has a basis, meaning I saw it, okay? I teach a Dhamma that has knowledge, knowledge that fits together. And I teach you a Dhamma that has an antidote. And I like it because he tells you right there, I found it. And I want to show you how to see it yourself and find it yourself. That's what he did. So he didn't come and start saying, say it this way because I said it this way or do it because I say do it. He tells you always when he teaches in his suttas, something about the problem of suffering, the cause of the suffering, the cessation of the suffering. And then sometimes he'll go to path. Sometimes he'll just explain to the person when they gave him the suffering, what the cause of it was and why it's happening that way and how he can fix it so it will happen in a way that's easier in life. That's how he does it. So these Four Noble Truths became his method of teaching and became his path of investigation, you see? So he says, the recluse Gautama teaches the Dhamma in this way with direct knowledge, not without the direct knowledge, and he teaches it in a very convincing way, not in an unconvincing way. That is the second quality for the reason my disciples will honor me, respect me, revere me, venerate me. And the next one is Udayan, my disciples esteem this, the higher wisdom, you know, I have to get the water. This is the adventure of living in India. I'll be right back. <laughs> okay, so the higher wisdom is where we are. Udayan, my disciples esteem me for the higher wisdom. Thus, the recluse Godama is wise. He possesses the supreme aggregate of wisdom. Now, why do we tell you that that means the word wise or wisdom is understanding clearly the 12 links of dependent origination, the three characteristics, and the four noble truths. That is the complete set of wisdom. It is impossible that he should not foresee the implications of an assertion or that he should not be able to confute with reasons, the current doctrines of others. He can debate them very easily because he has seen everything. And many of them at that time were simply coming down and, and teaching what had been handed down, handed down. They didn't need to see something before becoming a teacher. They were able to teach, just teach, and they taught directly, this is what it is without question. That's what I've discovered about that. And that he should not be able to, he should uh, be able to confute with reasons the current doctrines with others. No, so what do you think, Udayan? Would my disciples, knowing and seeing thus, would they break in and interrupt me? No, they would not, venerable sir. I do not expect instruction from my disciples. Invariably, it is my disciples who expect the instruction from me. And this is the third quality because of which my disciples honor me. We turn the page and then we go and he talks about the Four Noble Truths. And then he brings up the Four Noble Truths. He um, has satisfied them with the explanation of the Four Noble Truths. And then what happens is we go into, that's the fourth way, is, is through the Four Noble Truths. The fifth way is the way to develop the four, the wholesome with the wholesome states. I'm sorry, how, what is the way for you to develop your wholesome states? And the first thing listed is the four foundations of mindfulness, which we use Satipatthana for this reason, 
the external and internal body fully completely understanding i have proclaimed to my disciples the way to develop the four foundations of mindfulness and here a monk abides contemplating the body as a body he is ardent fully aware and mindful having put away any covetousness and grief for the world put everything away take a look at what this is and take a look how it is not me it is not mine it is not myself it is actually a um what it is it's an, an anatomy of a body and feeling is actually a feeling a feel see a feeling as just feeling he not a personal thing okay just try to see it just as it is and he abides contemplating mind as mind and he abides contemplating the mind objects as mind seeing the forms and sounds and odors and tastes and sensations just as what they are arising understanding they will be there and they will pass away every time fully aware and mindful having putting away covetous and grief for the world and thereby many disciples of mine abide having reached the consummation and the perfection of direct knowledge which means you understand completely it doesn't disturb you anymore now someone came and said but i can't meditate it's too noisy and you know they weren't training with us they, they were training in another place before and they didn't we got pounded with this in the beginning of my training the sound is just a sound and because i traveled with bonte taking care of traveling and taking care of the uh transportation and the tripping and things like that for so long we're in an airport and we're stuck his remark is okay everybody sit and concentrate uh, now I'll sit and concentrate in your meditation and everything's going on around you and you just let it all go and sit and do your meditation wherever you are in a train station downtown in the busiest time of day so the idea of having he wanted us to really abandon right as soon as we could abandon the per, the idea that meditation must be done in a silent place only he doesn't like that that's not what happened to the monks when they were in their uh, minute temples and such in the uh you know and in um the forest even is not a quiet place i always laughed about that because it is quiet at 2 30 in the morning but <laughs> you know uh through the night actually there's a lot of things going on with a lot of other people that are living in the forest other critters and there's a lot going on in the forest as far as sounds go until a certain time even in america in those forests where here i haven't had as much experience in asia but people tell me i'm telling it the right way <laughs> tell me the ones that have been sitting in the forest so sound is just a sound yeah okay and even if it's a bad taste it's there it'll go away you see and and sensation arises it's there it'll go away so you, you can trust that it will go away okay next one four right kinds of striving we've already described this this today we've already gone through this and then the last part the, the third one is the four bases of spiritual power and the four pieces to remember for spiritual power there's a sentence you say the monk develops the basis for spiritual power consisting in concentration due to something and determined striving. So what is it due to? It's due to enthusiasm, number one, due to energy, number two, due to purity of mind. Spiritual power can only get stronger if there is a purity of mind. How can there be a purity of mind? Keep practicing the six R's. If you practice the six R's, you are purifying the mind on the first two steps. You are recognizing any unwholesome mind state. You are releasing and relaxing on that state. You are purifying the mind. Then you it's due to invest investigation is the last one so 
you have to be investigating and just that means just simply watching the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape of how this whole thing works. That's how you're developing your spiritual power. So you're remembering EEPI, enthusiasm, energy, purification of mind, and investigation, the EEPI. I finally got it, so I can do it that way. <laughs> okay. Now, the five faculties, you are practicing the five faculties, and when you are doing these things right, and these all these things are related. If you drew them all on a big piece of paper, you'd start seeing how it's all related. I used to do these big whiteboards. People who have been to my retreats have seen them. You know, these big whiteboards. And then I'm drawing arrows, connecting all of these things together. One person said to me, why does it say mindfulness there, mindfulness here, and mindfulness over there? <laughs> mindfulness is important, OK? And why does it say energy here, energy here, and energy? You know, because there's energies at different points in your development different powers of energy for different things for staying in a steady steady track going down through experiencing everything okay so the five faculties are femqua f-e-m-c-w faith energy mindfulness concentration and wisdom remember that one those are what you are attempting to develop and there's energy again there see Okay, and then the powers, five powers are the same as the five faculties, same ones, femqua, but now it's automatic. It's going to happen automatic that these, the faith that this is correct and you get past thinking about, is this correct? Is this really what he taught? No, you get past that when you start experiencing first, second, third, Donna, you, ex you understand this is probably what was going on. So I want to let go of questioning the faith in that and see how far you can go with the path to have it go all the way through in its development. Then the seven enlightenment factors come and the, at the next part and those come into balance on the seesaw. We've sh I've shown you the seesaw before. And then the eightfold path, okay? So with those pieces, you have the... Um, four foundations of mindfulness, four kinds of right striving, and four spiritual power, okay? Then you have five faculties and five powers. Then you have seven factors of enlightenment. And the seven factors of enlightenment are the mindfulness piece, and that you have investigation, energy, and joy on one side of the teeter-totter. Here's Here is underneath, this is where the mindfulness sits and it's going like that, okay? So you have investigation, energy, mindfulness, I'm sorry, investigation and, and energy and joy. And on this other side over here, on the other side, you have tranquility because whenever joy fades away, there's tranquility left inside you. And if you sit someplace very quietly, after that, what happens is sukha comes up. And sukha is internal contentment and happiness. Not a lot of energy, but real calm energy. That one comes up, okay? And the last one is equanimity. And it, it says equanimity is just level. And how do you know if you're in equanimity? There's lot written about that today <laughs> you have equanimity and you have indifference and those two are what you should memorize equanimity is when you have perfect mindfulness and the ability to keep observing okay equanimity is when you have perfect mindfulness functioning indifference is when you have no mindfulness functioning there's no mindfulness functioning it's just indifference. It's time to get up and take a walk, sort of. That's where it's at. Yeah. And it could be coming in as indifference when you've been sitting a long time and you just haven't taken a break. It could waffle back. The energy goes down. And then you just get so, uh, and you, it's time to get up and take a walk. 
Don't do your practicing back to back. Make sure you're walking in between. That's really hyper important. I'm going to throw this out now for questions in any of this. And I hope that you saw how some of it was interwoven together. I want to put it out now for some questions. Do you want to stop? I the recording. Yeah, we should probably, we should, you, you put the okay. prayer in afterwards. So we'll stop the recording here and we'll go to part two and the part two will okay. be questioning. Question answers.